You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. This time, I was joined by Colin Fisher to discuss his addition to the Great War Group Introduction series entitled The War and Poetry. Poetry occupies a really interesting place in the history of the First World War. It's a setting of some very well-known poems. In Flanders Fields and other famous poems are used all the time when discussing the war or as part of memorialization or commemoration events. But as usual, the depth of the history of the war poets is far deeper than what you might initially expect. There were many different individuals who wrote poetry about the war, and they would all use their own experiences in different ways when writing about that war. In my conversation with Colin, we we break down three different types of poets from from three different categories, your patriotic, trench, and women poets. Each of these groups experienced the war in very different ways, and and that's apparent in their writings. You know, usually I do a lengthier introduction for these interviews, uh, but I'll be honest, you know, coming into this, I did not know a lot about poetry. Um, If you would have asked me, say, a month ago before I started researching for this interview, I would have known something about iambic pentameter but I wouldn't actually be able to describe what that is. And then I would be able to recite some Tolkien poetry, uh, but that's about it. I actually think Colin does a really great job in our first question, kind of discussing why poetry from the First World War has left such a lasting legacy. So let's just jump right in. Don't forget you can find out more about poetry and the war in Colin's book, which is linked in the show notes, or can be found over at greatwargroup.com. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. Today, I'm joined by Colin Fisher, the author of The War in Poetry, one of the Great War Introductions uh, books that will be coming out uh, around the time that this interview is released. Um, Hello, Colin. How's it going today? Hello, Wesley. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. Um, It's odd to think here I am sitting, I don't know how many thousands of miles away in Spain, and there you are over in the United States. So I'm just, uh, I'm just entranced by the technology, if nothing else. <laughs> the internet is a crazy thing sometimes. I'm old enough to be able to say that and almost get away with it. <laughs> um, okay, so you've written this book about First World War poetry. You know, I think that uh, poetry during the war is something that 
is very well known. It has quite quite the legacy. Uh, why do you think poetry has become so attached specifically to the First World War? That's that's a very good question because if you look at it, I suppose you want to say it logically, what society responds to a war on the scale of the Great War or the First World War by writing poetry and writing poetry on a scale that is quite staggering. It covers a whole range from the most sentimental, the most cloying, the most embarrassing and patriotic to the most heartfelt, the most horror struck. So I think there's just th- that question about why why would they even think about it? Uh, and I think there's there's a, a number of, of, of answers to that as as to why it's become so strongly uh, associated. I think it's from the, one is from the society itself. Uh, it's a society which on the one hand, although it has universal education, the vast majority of the population of Great Britain have nothing more than a primary education. Even the middle classes are extremely small and the upper class is even smaller. Their education is very classical. Uh, the whole ethos is obviously overtly Christian. Uh, however, I think one thing that they all have in common at that time is the value put on the spoken word. And above all, music and poetry is a place where people sing and it's a people who write and recite poetry and where poetry recitation in public is seen as an important part of cultural life on any scale. So we're talking about a literate society, which on the one hand seems very limited, but on the other hand is maybe drawing on more popular elements of culture and putting value onto poetry. Uh, so I think there's just the, the seriousness of intent that comes over in even the most cloying of, 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 of poetry. On the other hand, it is so much embedded within the British curriculum it's hard now to think of anyone from ages 12 up to, well, you name it, uh, well beyond my 60 years, who has not gone through that process at school. It's such an embedded part of anyone's education here that you certainly come through, for better or for worse, knowing something about Wolf of Dawn and Siegfried Sassoon. And, I, and so I think that just keeps up very much to the consciousness. And I think in the acts of remembrance, sometimes the acts of celebration, where you're wanting that counterpoint, where you're wanting to create a backdrop in which to put a context, poetry and music and art to a large extent are, thing, are, are those perfect counterpoints to put there against the horrific statistics, uh, the sheer consumption of of human life. The sheer consumption of of physical resources, poetry feeds into that, but also or feeds from that and also stands stands apart from it. And I think finally I would say there's just something within I would not quite argue, but more anecdotally, would sort of say within British society in general, the sense of drama and theatre, the sense of performance for what is considered to be quite an enclosed and shuttered society is actually quite notable. You know, the act of public speaking is valued highly. Uh, being able to to draw on a variety of sources and quotes is also admired. And just, I think this feeds into the whole sense of pageant. If there's one society that does well in celebrating, remembering uh, the sense of, or even sense of grief and loss on a national scale, I think it's Britain does it extremely well. And I think All of these things feed into this strong link of poetry with the Great War. Not always with the intended outcome, perhaps, and we have to be careful how we approach it, but I think in terms of looking at a kind of national cultural icon, it's there, and it's deep, and it's embedded, and I only see that continuing in the the generations ahead. So, so you know, speaking to you personally, you know, what has drawn you to the poetry and sort of how did you kind of try to approach the subject within your book? Well, I mean, again, I, I was actually thinking about this myself just uh, recently. Uh, 
Uh, and I can remember the English lesson. I can remember the English teacher, Mr. Dewar. I can remember the classroom and where I was sitting, where he read to us, and we didn't read. He read to us Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. And it was like a thunderclap. I'd never come across this before. As someone interested in military history, uh, with uh, family links with the Great War, some idea of the kind of popular culture associated with it. I'd never, ever heard poetry with such immediacy. You know? And I think this uh, to any young male, I think anything that has that sense of urgency about it, of authenticity, of breaking the rules, and yet with a clear goal in mind, is, is in itself attractive. Mr. Dewar himself, we knew, had served in the Second World War, and that just only added to the authenticity. So I think there's that element to it. But then I think also following my chronology through through the decades is that realisation that what we regard as, as powerful, as authentic, uh, as almost didactic, well, there are other voices involved. And it's not that I came into the book with an idea that Isaac Rosenberg would occupy such an important part has changed my opinion about poetry. But the feeling was that this is a big subject. It's not enough to see it just in terms of Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. And perhaps if there's any fault within the British education system, it doesn't look in this genre in a wider sense. So my feeling was there must be outliers here. There must be outsiders here. There are other voices. And this feeling that has grown over the years is that for poetry to work, it simply has to be poetry. It it has to be that first and foremost. Cataloguing the horrors of humanity does not necessarily create poetry. And they were writing poetry. And I feel we do them justice. We do them credit. We respect these people more by seeing it in terms of poetry. So there's just that sense of the changes that take place in you as an individual, where you begin to see that, yes, we are rational, we are logical beings, uh, we study, we get uh, degrees, we have careers, but we're also moved by music and we're moved by poetry. And, and, and the first expressions of humanity in any society, in any cave painting, in any evidence of, of, of worship, is to do with sound and to do with music. And I think there's just an element of realising, you know, we, we, we are kind of primitive uh, and we are moved by powerful emotions. And that kind of feels, well, here I go. Let's, let's see what I find. Uh, and then I think the other one would just be being very kindly asked by uh, the Great War group to actually just go ahead and do it. They took a risk, but I'm assuming they saw something in me that they felt was was worth taking that risk. So from the mundane to the everyday to the chance and to the, the accumulation of experiences over over the years. So when we kind of look at the various groups of poets during the war, there, there are different people sort of looking at the war from different places when they are, are writing their work. Um, so, so I'm going to kind of break those up and we'll talk about some of the groups individually. So first we're going to look at a kind of patriotic poets. So these are kind of probably the most famous group of individuals that wrote about the war. And so what what surprised you the most as you were researching those, these poets uh, who are names that many people might actually recognize? How good they were as poets. That was one <laughs> of the big surprises because I'm, again, that generation that grew up with lions led by donkeys which, you know, does not do justice to any aspect of the British involvement in in the Great War. But it colours so much. So people like Rupert Brooke uh, were seen as uh, flying the flag for the British cause, for God's cause, for the Anglo-Saxons. And as you go actually read and you think, by God, that man could write poetry. And you look at his, at his evolution as a poet. This is the thing. He was already a successful poet beforehand. He was all, already had his notorious personal life. He already accumulated so much of life experience before 
he joins up in, 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 in 1914 before he goes to Belgium. Uh, and he's writing in what's called the, the is one of the Georgian poets, which simply means King George is the new king. It's not Queen Victoria. It's not Edward anymore. Uh, so we are new. Uh, and he's, he's writing love poetry. Uh, he's writing emotional poetry. It's about feelings. Uh, it's very much from his point of view. And then you watch that, that, that the, the, the poetry that, that he's writing after he's had his active service over in Belgium. And you can see the evolution there. He's developing as, as, uh, as a poet. And, you know, I would find it, you know, very hard not to be moved by peace. Now, God be thanked who has matched us with this hour and caught our youth and wakened us for sleeping. With hand made sure, clear eye and sharp in power to turn as swimmers into cleanness leaping. I mean, that's a hell of an opening piece of poetry on, on, on any level. And it contrasts strongly with, uh, with what he'd written uh, uh, before the war. You have Robert Bridges then, who's much older. He's the poet laureate. And from the very start, he is committed as a Briton, as a Christian, to the war effort. He is a poet laureate. He is to capture the, the spirit of, of the country. And he doesn't do it. He struggles. He is too much of a poet. He doesn't have youth on his side. Uh, he, if you read his poetry now from, uh, from the war, uh, glorifying Nelson, it's, it's not doggerel, but it's it's not great poetry. However, and I think this is important, you follow his trajectory through and you see that even he, struggling to come to terms with this conflict, is, is able to more than come up with, uh, uh, with the goods. He writes in uh, the West Front. He's replying to John Maysfield written a very strange travel book called The Old Front Line, as if you're going to the trenches, as if you're uh, visiting them as, as, as a tourist. And he takes it from the point of view of a, a woman, that has, a, a mother that has lost a son. And it's, it's poetry that maybe doesn't we find difficult today, but you cannot deny the emotion uh, uh, behind it. She's saying, no country know I so well as this landscape of hell. Why bring you to my pain these shadowed effigies of barbed wire, riven trees, the corpse-strewn, blasted plain? He's not so much of a patriot that he doesn't see the reality of war on, on the Western Front. And he's, in that one poem, I think, able to harness his poetic skill in a way that I think even now we can still respond to and we can still value. I, th I think the one that personally surprised me the most was Rudyard Kipling. I was not expecting to warm to him in the way that I did. He's always got his own personal loss, uh, uh, the, the death of his own son, and yet he confronts reality uh, uh, and in a way that has got levels of meaning, layers of meaning that you can't just dismiss as patriotic poetry. Nor should I think you should just necessarily dismiss patriotic poetry because it's patriotic. Look at it as, as poetry. Towards the end of the war, and he did write his fair share of just sheer patriotic poetry, but towards the end of the war, he writes what's called his epitaphs. He's drawing on an earlier Greek model, uh, which in itself was drawing on an earlier model where heroes, where the dead were given a, a stone in, in engraving on their tomb. And this becomes a, a literary form in itself. And he draws on that. He's writing this very short, pithy pithis. And this is from 1917, 1918. We can't say the war is going well for Britain. And here's this patriotic poet. Uh, uh, and he has one called The Coward. It's two lines long. I could not look on death, which being known, men led me to him blindfold and alone. He's talking about a, a man uh, condemned to the firing squad uh, for cowardice, for desertion, who knows. But here is, here is the man of empire, and he's seeing it from the point of view of 
the accused. He is seeing it from the point of view of the man who is already dead writing his own epitaph. He never loses faith in the righteousness of the of the war. Uh, but he is willing, again, to use those poetic skills to, uh, to expand upon our own experiences of what it could be for so many people. And he writes about 20 or 30 of them, and they're all from different points of view. There's one, uh, a soldier, a man, assuming a bit older, he's too ashamed to use the latrine with the rest of the men. He goes off in the trenches to go to the bathroom, and he gets killed by a sniper. And he says, do not condemn me. I mean, to even choose that subject, given who you are, Rudyard Kipling, the most famous writer in the world, the, 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 the upholder of, of empire, and to write that, I just find that fascinating. So I mean, that's been a kind of long way of to answer your question there, but I hope it gives people listening to this some idea of the richness that there is in, in the poetry, even those who are seen as being patriotic and therefore not possibly authentic. And I mean, you could go on. We've got uh, in, 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 in Flanders Fields, which when you look at it, and it was seen at the time, it's seen at the time as a religious poem, at a time when the resurrection was exceedingly real and troublesome for many people of that time. How would the dead come back? How would we know them? And he has the dead, McRae, talking to us. And if you look at the uh, at the newspaper reports, even up to 1918, churches, one of the poems which they will read out from the pulpit as consolation is in Flanders Fields. These were poems of consolation, but they're all also poems of great thought as well. It's really interesting that you mention sort of some of the challenges that some poets had in writing about the war. I think I think there's there's often a lot of conversation around how the war was something that nobody really expected and it was something quite different than than the wars that had come before and that often manifests in military or political terms. But but seeing poets who were who were quite skilled kind of struggle to turn the experiences that they were seeing around them into into poems is an interesting sort of insight into a society kind of struggling to, to deal with, with what they were experiencing. I would agree with that. And I think this is where part of the answer comes to, again, this kind of British equation, because, you know, I'll quite open about it. That's who I've concentrated upon. Now, I think there's a, probably other jewels to discover uh, in, in, in other countries. But if you're looking at, at it from this British cultural aspect, there's the element of continuity. Obviously, this war does fall like a like a thunderclap. Uh, and yet, the degree of adaptation to society that was extremely socially stratified, in some ways, is also its strength. It not only survives the First World War, but goes on after the First World War without any revolutions from any side. There's a great deal of continuity, and I think that's what these poets are drawing on, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. So they're always looking back to the models of the past. So they're looking to uh, Yeats, when when perhaps we uh, uh, talk uh, about uh, Wilfred Owen. We can go back to the Roman poets, Juvenal and the satires, looking at what Sassoon was doing with with his anger. The pastoral poets... Uh, and and you look at what Edmund Blunden is doing. You look at many of the sonnets that women were writing. So the, here, here we've got a society coming to terms with loss on a scale we cannot imagine. I mean, we, we rightly mourn the loss of any service personnel, be they one, be they 20, be they 50. But in the Battle of Jutland, one ship goes down, and, and, and that is over a thousand men dead in minutes. When you have uh, the casualty rate on the first day of the psalm, and then it carries on into the autumn, we cannot for one moment understand how a society could understand that degree of stress, although we understand the nature of grief and the nature of loss. I don't think we now have that same sense of continuity. 
I don't think we have that sense of consciously drawing, in this case, on poetic traditions from the past. I'm not saying necessarily that, that, that we have to. But I think it's interesting to see people like Bridges, who is such an innovative poet, but so self-consciously creating a sort of medieval uh, sense of the value that is given to, to the written word, almost like a craft. And then you've also got a writer such as Eleanor Farjohn uh, consciously ad- adapting the, the sonnet. Uh, and yet she does it more successfully because I think she's willing to be herself. I think Robert Bridges uh, is too conscious about, about his role. So once again, I keep coming back to the same thing. We're talking about war poetry in, in, in the Great War, the diversity of it. And yet... You do find these common these common strands. I cannot begin to imagine how any nation in those years of war was able to withstand it on any level. And I do not, in the end, really understand why they dedicated so much time to writing poetry about it. I do, but it seems such a such a a, a visceral reason. That you think no, 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 that that can't be true, and actually, it probably is. Um, so, so, you know, thinking about sort of how societies were reacting to to these events, there's also a much more kind of zoomed in experience where we have people in the trenches, you know, people actually fighting the war at the front, soldiers, also writing poetry, and and that survives. I feel like they probably offer kind of a unique glimpse into the experiences of, of the war. You know, they are directly involved in a way that no matter how good sort of older poets are, they, they can't have those experiences. So what does their poetry tell us about their experiences? That they were bloody good poets. <laughs> and it did not matter if they were having seven kinds of shit shelled out of them like Isaac Rosenberg they found times to write poetry it did not matter if they were staring into the abyss of of mental illness they wrote poetry about it it did not matter if it contradicted the very fibre of their being in terms of almost how many English and I do mean English officers went into war self-consciously feeling that they were defending uh, an English countryside that perhaps they had never visited, that the poetry of Keats was what sustained them. And it did for, for many of them. It's almost a cliche, and yet it's a cliche because it's, it's, it's true. If you look at Sassoon and Owen, they're writing poetry in Craig Lockhart in the, in the hospital where uh, well, Owen's been sent with shell shock, although it's called uh, neurasthenia. Uh, so soon because they just have to get them out of the way uh, uh, and they're writing poetry there based on their experiences you look at Blunden, uh, an officer and he's writing poetry near enough the front line you look at Isaac Rosenberg he's writing the bloody stuff right in the trenches on scraps of paper which he then sends back to his sister to type up to such an extent that his officer, who was also the censor of his, of his letters, you think you are the first person to read a poem by Isaac Rosenberg. And his response says, stop writing this bloody rubbish, because he couldn't stand it anymore. I mean, he had to read every single poem Isaac Rosenberg wrote. What a joy. No, what a horror. Yet, yet, Edmund Blunden, Poet, they know, his officer knows that he's had poetry published. And he thinks highly of them. I think Sassoon does as well. Sassoon's commanding officer just can't understand why such a brave man, such a sensitive soul, such a great leader would make that declaration. And in the end, to be honest, neither would Sassoon. So what I'm saying is it's maybe not what we expect. If we want an eyewitness account, read an eyewitness account. Uh, uh, Carrington's, uh, I can't remember, is it John Carrington's Soldier from a War Returning? Uh, I'd wanted to maybe invoke, include that in this idea of, of authenticity. 
uh, and, and and he's writing as a you know first hand account as a junior officer, and he's giving the the opinion is whatever mistakes we made, we learn from them. I never felt let down by my officers. I never felt betrayed by my commanders. Uh, and he doesn't say himself, but he's a very effective uh, leader within the trenches. So he can offer a great deal, and there's others as well. What these, in this case, these uh, the men that I look at, Sassoon, Owen, uh, uh, Blunden, and, and Rosenberg offer, is basically that the human spirit is unquenchable. I think I think that's what I would say. And I think, again, I mean, this would be one of the poems that I know that uh, Mr. Dewar uh, uh, would have would have read. Uh, Strange Meeting by Wolford, Ro- by Wolford Owen. It seemed out of battle I escaped down some profound dull tunnel long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there encumbered sleepers groaned too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. Then as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands as if to bless. And by his smile, I knew that sullen hall. By his dead smile, I knew we stood in hell. Now, at that point, he could have said, you know, my name's Wolford Owen. You've been a wonderful audience. I'm out of here. He's done it. He's done it. He's fulfilled his, his poetic license. Uh, but he carries on, and he's pulling his full creative powers in the darkest moment, uh, much darker than perhaps when in the trenches. You know, he's having to confront daily his nightmares. He's having to talk about them with the doctors at, at Craig Lockett, which is all part of the of the cure, the talking cure. And it, but he writes beautiful poetry, and that's almost uncomfortable because he is talking about death underground he's talking about the claustrophobia he's talking about the intimacy of death you know he talks about the frown that goes over the face of a bayoneted man this is this is someone who has has cleared a trench uh and it, this idea of authentic is something that i think we've developed certainly in the uk since the 60s uh it's something that the the war itself, the British society at the time, did not see. What they saw was poetry. So they would include in their anthologies, there would be work by Sassoon, not by Owen. He's, he, he stands out on his own later on. But they include work by, by Sassoon with many other poets who didn't necessarily actually fight in the, in, in the trenches. Now, I mean, I, London, I mean, again, if I read from... Uh, a part of rural economy. There was winter in those woods, and still it was July. There were thule solitudes with thousands huddling nigh. There the fox had left his den. The scraped holes hid not stoats but men. That last little detail, hid not stoats but men. He's writing this pastoral poetry based on the model of the 19th century, and he subverts it wonderfully. So what does it tell us about uh, the poets there, about life in the trenches? They brought themselves fully to it. And that, I think, is a, is a hopeful message uh, because it's seen as an anonymous war of nameless deaths. And, well, it was in many ways. But Rosenberg, for example, I would love to have met Rosenberg. I think he would have been utterly fascinating. He says he's a poet. And being at war, being in the trenches, means I am developing myself as a poet and I will carry on after the war. He does not expect to die. He is not part of the doomed nation uh, of youth. He fully expects to survive and he fully expects, as he would have done, become one of Britain's greatest poets. There's no two ways about it. Brooke is already a great poet. Eisenberg is, in retrospect, he is. He's a fascinating figure. But he would have become a great poet, and that's what he expected to be. So in this world of battalions and, and, and brigades and divisions and, and, and armies, in this case, men, a group of men, were determined to hold on to what was important to them and to hone their skills. It wasn't enough just to be angry and outraged. It was to do it better and better and better. Uh, and I think Owen, 
is an example of that. The before and after is, is, is quite phenomenal. So it's maybe not the answer that people are expecting. It's not a guidebook to the trenches, but it's a guidebook to something to do with the human spirit, the human soul within the trenches of all the different ways that we can react to stress, including having German mining workers being thrown at us. Yet, there's Rosenberg in his trench scribbling another one of his bloody poems which he's going to send to his officer who's going to go, oh my God, he's written another one. I have to read another one of these. Come <laughs> <Absolutely>. on. <laughs> and he must have thought that. He must have thought that. You were the first person to read a poem by Isaac Rosenberg. And in some way, it's a charming story. And it would have been a shame in a way if he had reacted any other way. <laughs> very, very true. Um, yeah, I think that it's poems are often, I find poems quite interesting a lot of times. And this is particularly apparent with, with sort of men who were fighting in the war in what they choose to describe, what they choose to, to talk about, like what, what sort of motivates them to write uh, about something. I know you sent me, you sent me one by Isaac Rosenberg, dead man's dump. And it, I read through it and it's, it doesn't, talk about maybe what you would expect a, a poem to talk about from a soldier if you were just jumping in. I would in. agree. I would agree. But but how it is structured and what it talks about and it it gives it paints I don't want to say paints a picture because that, that seems reductive in some ways of comparing it to, to another form of art. But it just is is such a, a really interesting and evocative read. I, I I would agree. It's one that I go back to repeatedly and it's one that sticks in 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 my mind i mean you can read owen and just get drawn into the sheer beauty of his of of his of his words you read blunden and you struggle but you realize what he's trying to do and the reward is there so soon is angry he's just angry all the time and you go so soon you're angry uh, uh, and i can kind of understand why uh, but you read Rosenberg, and you read some, and you think, "Oh no, that's just that's just not going anywhere." Uh, and yet, then you read someone like, "Well, there's well, well, there's two a uh, break of the day in the trenches, which is perhaps more well known. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer sardonic rat, rat, as I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear." So you know that that's probably more well known by 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 listeners, and, and the image of the rat as being the observer, the silent sardonic observer, is one that we can all respond to. And you read, you read Dead Man's Dump, the plunging limbers over the shattered track, racketed with their rusty freight, stuck out like many crowns of thorns, and the rusty stakes like scepters old to stay the flood of British men upon our brothers dear. No, Shakespeare could be writing that, I believe, that that impact. And you carry on, and it's a poet, it's a poem of visions in the sense of Milton, perhaps more of Blake. I think Milton, the idea of, of the hell in which they're in. Uh, Blake, just for the sheer number of visions. Obviously, I mean, Rosenberg as a Jew himself, I don't think a practicing Jew by this stage, and maybe for, 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 for many years. You look at his own uh, theatre, his own uh, dramatic work. You look at other poems. The the Old Testament God is is very present, and I think there's something of that, of the Old Testament in Dead Man's Dump. Uh, we've got words like lurched, sprawled, crunched, huddled, crying, uh, uh, man born of man and born of 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 woman everything is either movement motion or truncated movement and motion i couldn't decide whether i see it as cinematic i couldn't decide if i see it as uh, as a symphony in the end he's going to say isaac i'm just going to trust you you're just going to take me through this experience which for you may have lasted a couple of minutes he's basically he's on a limber uh his his 
before he went back into the trenches for the last time. He's part of a transport detachment, bringing barbed wire, munitions up to the front line. Uh, if it's munitions, you're manhandling uh, heavy boxes through, through trenches. If it's barbed wire, you're taking it through the trenches. I mean, how they did that, I don't know. And then out into no man's land, you're doing all of this. And at some point, as must have happened in many occasions, the dead have come to the surface and you can't avoid them. You either step on them or, in this case, he's on, he's on the, the, the limber, he's on the carriage and the wheels roll over. But it's the change of perspective. It's a change of tone. So he talks about Earth has waited for them, talking about the dead. Earth has waited for them all the time of their growth, fretting for their decay. Now she has them at last, in the strength of their strength, suspended, stopped in hell. And that repetition of S just softens the whole thing because he's talking about Mother Earth and she's bringing back her children, the dead. And then, what do we have? We've got what fierce imaginings their dark souls lit. Earth, have they gone into you? Somewhere they must have gone and flung on your hard back is their soul sack, emptied of God, ancestral essences. Who hurled them out? Who hurled? And he's now, he's now, the anger, the outrage, the questioning, who? Who hurled? Tell me. He's interrogating. And that's the way through the whole poem, is this continual change of tone, this continual change of perspective, without losing the essence that Isaac Rosenberg was struck by the fact that he was the only one that noticed that the carriage was rolling over dead, both German and British. And he does not lose sight of human egoism. He's not actually sorry for the dead. He says, what of us who flung on the shrieking pyre walk our usual thoughts untouched, our lucky limbs as on ichor fed, immortal seeming ever. Perhaps when the flames beat loud on us, a fear may choke in our veins and the startled blood may stop. And this time the repeated S becomes punctuation. Startled blood may stop. And that's you and me. And it's the danger of us losing our lives and joining these dead who again wish to communicate with us. And that's what I cannot decide. Is the man that the carriage rolls over dead, alive, or is it the air just being crushed out of his lungs by, you can imagine, these heavy limber wagons? I cannot re recommend this poem enough. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone will agree with me after they've read it, but I would recommend it. And if, again, that question, what does it tell us about that experience in the trenches? It tells you that you could bring that fierce poetic vision that draws on ancient Jewish religious faith and the 18th century poetry of Blake, then that's what, you can do surrounded by what must have been just a blasted landscape in which literally you were walking on the dead. I, uh, I will just say uh, all the poems that we're talking about here today, there's going to be a list of them in the show notes for people to look at. And I will include some links to online versions if I can find them. And I would just say about Dead Man's Dump, I think the, the line about, you know, Earth has waited for them all the time of their growth fretting for their decay. That's probably going to stick with me for a long time after I read that one. So, Well, I'm, I'm glad. If, it's a strange thing maybe to say, <laughs> but I'm glad uh, because I feel I'm not entirely alone. And I just to finish, that word fretting for their decay, is that a, a mother that even with the dead is worried about the decomposition of of her children. As you say, just that one line, you walk away, and as you say, that 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 stays with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so moving away from the trenches, I know you also put some focus on uh, women poets during the war. You know, they had a unique experience. You know, they, they weren't fighting at the front. They maybe were in a different place within society at this time. 
So what were their interactions with the war and how was that showcased in, in the poetry that they wrote? Uh, it can be summed up as simply saying as varied as any man, as varied as any person. Uh, it made me realize very strongly a, lot, a number of things. One, talking about war poetry uh, in the singular does not do justice. Uh, and quite clearly to talk about women's poetry in the war simply would be uh, be an atrocious statement, I think, to make. It's, again, to use your phrase, so reductive to lose all the subtleties. So in the way that perhaps I've given some idea of the range of, of, of uh, poetic voices uh, within what you could call the group of pat- uh, patriotic poets and, 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 and trench poets, I think you find that same variety, you do find that same variety, with women writing about it. You do find uh, women writing quite clearly, overtly patriotic poetry. Jesse Pope is one of the most famous. Uh, Who's for the trench? Are you my laddie? Who'll follow French? Are you my laddie? And they set it to music and they sang it all the way through the war. Uh, So whatever we feel about it, it met a need in certain parts of British society, possibly not men returning from the front, certainly people there at at the home front. But then you also get Helen Hamilton. And again, these are not necessarily known names, and Helen Hamilton isn't. But here she's writing, I wish you would refrain from making glad romance of this most hideous war. Now, it's not clear she's writing about uh, Jesse Pope. I'd be very surprised if she wasn't. So you have that response straight away. Uh, separation and loss comes through a great deal. You you you, you see that so many times. Uh, we can okay maybe I've talked about that people like uh, Sassoon and Owen and Blunden Rosenberg. Uh, they're not necessarily when they always say eyewitnesses, but they're drawing deeply on those experiences. Obviously, for women at home, well, it's about childcare. It's about work. Uh, it's about the daily commute. Uh, it's it's about in-laws. Uh, it, it's about coping with the worry of separation and about what's happening to your husband, happening to your brother, happening to your fiancé, happening, happening to your son. And so you do find uh, quite a few uh, poems uh, about that. You find one, Anna Gordon Keown, uh, my thought shall never be that you're dead, who laughed so lately in this quiet place, and ending up the poem with being so very sure you are not dead. It's a very interesting poem. Uh, it makes you realise what a, a close relationship there was between, whether it's based on, on, on a real experience or not, but, be, uh, but uh, between the woman talking in the poem and her husband, her fiance, her boyfriend, who who has gone who has gone overseas, uh, that, that you still have that desire within a couple to create a closed world in which you are the only inhabitant. You can see others outside, and she does mention those in the poem. But it's that strength of commitment to the idea of the relationship that comes through, whether or not she's naive to believe that, that, her, that her husband is not dead, I don't know. But it's an interesting response nonetheless. And you see that theme coming out in, 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 in other poems. Uh, Eleanor Farjohn, uh, for example, is another poet who, who draws in that. Uh, you also get sort of uh, themes that come through, particularly to do with munitions workers, who are often associated with a, a morally looser kind of lifestyle. They're seen as being younger. They're being seen uh, as having more opportunities to enjoy themselves. They have their own income. Uh, and very often, these poems are actually not written by the women working in the munitions factories. I could imagine that uh, a six-day week, 12-hour days, it doesn't leave a lot of time for writing that poetry. Uh, Isaac Rosenberg did get leave occasionally. Uh, Sassoon and Owen and London are taken out of the line at various times. But that unceasing grind of munitions work doesn't leave a great deal of 
time to write poetry. But then you've also got, and this is what this is, this is what uh, I found fascinating. Was a, again, I've I've mentioned before Eleanor Farjohn. Uh, she was already a successful poet, was to be a very successful children's writer in the twenties and thirties and and beyond. Uh, Yeats was astounded by her ability to t- uh, churn out a sonnet on on the drop of a hat, and you read. She has three poems that you'd call war poems. You read her anthology at the end of uh, the war, uh, so published, I think it's after November 1918, and you would wonder if actually she had actually lived through the war years. She doesn't do war work. She lives out in the Cambridge countryside. Uh, There's not a a, a suggestion that uh, she is anything less but you know, uh, a nice person, but she was also a friend with David Thomas, uh, 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 who was also a a famous war poet. Uh, And she writes three poems, and she writes a fourth one, which she can't publish because she was very much in love with David Thomas. Uh, David Thomas was already married. She's also a very good friend with David Thomas's uh, wife. And he writes a, a letter to her, which it arrives after his death. Uh, and it's an incredibly poignant uh, poem. In the last letter that I had from France, you thanked me for the silver Easter egg, which I had hidden in the box of apples. You liked to munch beyond all other fruit. You found the egg the Monday before Easter and said, I will praise Easter Monday now. It was such a lovely morning. Then you spoke of the coming battle and said, this is the eve, goodbye, and may I have a letter soon. Now, this is the woman that Yeats <sighs> praises for her ability to write sonnets, but it's also a criticism. She's taken those lines from the letter that he wrote to her, which she could not publish because clearly this is a married man writing to her. And then the final verse, that Easter Monday was a day for praise. It was such a lovely morning. In our garden, we sowed our earliest seeds, and in the orchard, the apple bud was ripe. It was the eve. There are three letters that you will not get. She'd written three letters to him in that interval between him writing and then uh, her sending these, these letters off. If there's a question of authenticity, and I've maybe raised that with some of the trench poets, if you want to call them that, that to me is the authentic voice of someone overwhelmed with loss but able to direct it in a way that speaks to the generations and that has to be a quality of poetry so we don't have shells we don't have explosions we don't have the legions of the death but by god we've got what it is for a person, a woman, who was devoted to this man, who also recognised that in the relationship she was very much an enabler and someone who had encouraged David Thomas to pursue his own poetic career before Robert Frost did, that despite all of that, the sense of poignancy is what comes over there. You know, you, you contrast that with Isaac Rosenberg, and the first impression is, well, it's it's chalk and cheese. You know, how can you how can you compare the two here? Well, I think you can. I think you can with the sense of inner poetic vision that allows the control of language, the use of meter, the use of rhythm, the use of imagery to conjure up a unique personal experience that is being interpreted through poetry. And I mean, I've maybe gone on too much here over over one poem, but I think I want to do that almost on purpose to show, I hope, that it is worthwhile going down other avenues when you talk about war poetry. Uh, one other that came out for me that I was really taken with, Nancy, Nancy Cunard, air, well, almost heiress to the 
Cunard fortune. That's certainly where the, fa- the, the family money comes from. And she's a young woman in her early 20s. Uh, she marries. It's a, a society wedding. Uh, she's travelled widely. She's houses a house in London, a house in the countryside. A deeply unhappy, a deeply troubled young woman who is unsatisfied with the role that she has. Uh, she becomes friendly with Edith Sitwell, uh, with her with her brothers as well, and she wants to be a poet. And here's what she writes: I saw the people climbing up the street. Maddened with war and strength and thought to kill. And after followed death, who held with skill his torn rags royally and stamped his feet. And then it goes on. And many died and hid in unfound places, in the black ruins of the frenzied night. And death still followed in the surplice, white and streaked in imitation of their faces. And that's in 1916. And again, I've kind of chosen her again, age, experience, she's not well known. She's a young woman who has already experienced loss. She's met up with the Sitwells, and they're a very privileged group in society. There's no two ways about it, but they want to do something different. Talked about Rupert Brooke as being the Georgian poet, and they're seen as being revolutionary in their time. Well, they reject all of that. They want nothing to do with that. And she writes, I think it was five or six poems that go into what was called the Wheels Anthology. And the Wheels Anthology is notorious at the time. It plays a central part in the development of modernist poetry, particularly bearing fruit in the post-war period. We immediately think of T.S. Eliot. And I believe that reading here, Nancy Cunard, not that she is going to inspire T.S. Eliot, but she's that first sign of a fundamental change within English poetry that exists until today. Now, she is denigrated at the time as being a woman, as being young, as being a society girl. You can debate whether it's great poetry. And and I've given quite a few examples through, through this interview so far. People can decide for themselves. But I'll argue her corner. I'll argue her 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 value as much as Eleanor Farjohn talking about the love for a man that she can never publicly state, but can create such beauty. And I I am happy to defend the corner of Nancy Cunard, this privileged young woman who was trying to do something different, who was trying to push the boundaries of poetry and reflect the age. If it's not war poetry, I think my argument is in the book, it's certainly poetry can only be written in war. She sees the cracks in society. You know, we've talked about, I have the, the, the continuity within British society. I've talked about the, the strengths of, in a way, of a socially stratified system, one that draws on quite established poetic traditions, popular and also formal. Uh, but she's seeing beyond that. She's seeing beyond the curtain. And she creates images of creatures of darkness. And you could dismiss it as, well, that's what young people write poetry about. I don't think that's good enough. I think we've got to recognise that the legacy of Great War poetry comes from different sources than normally we expect. Yes, the curriculum is clearly dominated by the likes of Sassoon and Owen. But again, if you just push out your search a little bit wider and come across people like Farjohn, come across people like Nancy Cunard, you see. You see the poetry that we have now. Very hard to write in the style of Sassoon, of Owen, of Blunden, of Rosenberg. It would be pastiche. But I believe that what we see in in, in the examples that I've given by Eleanor Farjohn and by uh, Nancy Cunard, you can say, yes, I can see those seeds at the time and I can see how they've borne fruit later on. Now, Eleanor Farjohn does not then develop this idea of, I mean, of taking uh, established texts, be they letters, diaries. You could imagine later on newspaper articles, uh, magazine uh, articles, and then chopping and changing in the way that William Burroughs would do in the 50s and 60s. But she did do it in 1918. 
And I think that's really, really interesting. And again, just to make us all pause, I hope, and to realize that this topic that, that, that we're looking at is broader, is deeper. Even an introduction to poetry in the Great War, I hope, if I've done my job well enough, I hope if what I, half of what I've said has made sense today, that people will see, oh, it's maybe not what I expected. It's maybe worth going back. And as you say, using the links that you're going to put up, using the suggested reading in the book, develop their own interests and their own tastes. Uh, I, th- I think it's something that is maybe slightly confined, confined, if that's the right word, to academia. Uh, you do deep, rigorous literary analysis. Uh, that's not something that I can do. Uh, but I certainly feel that I hope I can transmit that sense of emotion, raw emotion, that poetry can evoke, and sometimes an insight into the lives of people at that time. So, as I say, looking at the different, at the variety of poets, men, women, trenches, home front, whoever, is just being able to, it's opened so many doors and made me look differently both at Great War poetry and also poetry in general. And that, I think, has to be part of the criteria for looking on as being successful or not.